Amen. So uh, we're starting uh, a new series today, uh, and I hope that you can come uh, over the next three weeks um, just to listen to what um, the Holy Spirit is putting upon my heart. And so I'm um, going to talk on miracles, um, or I think the, the title there that I see is the God of miracles. And so uh, for me, it's going to be today, and we're going to look at faith an atmosphere of faith next week and the following week then we're going to look at um, healing restoration what does that look like uh, what does the word of God say um, about that let me make a, a statement this morning if you're if you're writing down and you're taking notes this would be good um, just a good place to start this morning and it's this here we serve a supernatural God amen, amen. he is a God of wonders um, he is a God of signs he is a God of miracles. Can we all say a big amen to that? Amen. And what I want us to do over the next few weeks is uh, to journey together. Uh, just to journey together into a renewed or a revived exp expectation. It's not that you don't believe or I don't believe. It's sometimes our expectation needs to be revived. Um, and to be renewed. And I want us uh, to be a revived expectation um, of a heaven kingdom filled atmosphere, a church filled atmosphere, a people filled atmosphere, which is miraculous, uh, which is supernatural, and which is powerful. And I want to deposit, um, you know, there is such a thing as a spiritual deposit, somebody imparting into your lives. So I want to impart. Uh, and deposit into you and to revive in us as a church a renewed expectation that God's kingdom among us um, is filled with signs, uh, wonders, supernatural, uh, overflows in the miraculous. Why? Because God is here. Why is the miraculous? Because God is here. God is here. And I'm hoping after these few weeks that there will be an us by whatever degree, because sometimes the Bible talks about faith can be 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. Um, by whatever degree, um, I just want her to see an, an increased faith in miracles, uh, in expectation, where impossible things happen to impossible people or possible people. Where at the end of it, we're able to say, do you know what I think? I think God can do this. I, I, I think we can believe for a miracle. Wouldn't you like that to be church? W wouldn't you like that to be your experience? That we see miracles and we see God doing something amazing. Give me a big amen this morning. Um, I want to give you a thought, and it's really my thought this morning. Um, and it's a thought to challenge me, but it's also a thought to challenge, to challenge you this morning. I, I think that most of the church... Uh, and I guess it lies in leadership because the church is a reflection of their leadership. I think most leaders um, um, have opted in, in this generation for a uh, singular focus, a singular aspect of the kingdom, of the gospel message. And so the modern church, we have put our emphasis on soul winning, um, which is the highest pursuit after worship. Uh, worship comes before evangelism. If you want to have a strategy for evangelism, be a worshiper first. Evangelism flows out of worship. So the highest thing in the Word of God is worship. Out of that flows evangelism. So the modern church is doing a really brilliant job in putting its emphasis on soul winning and what we're doing as a church collectively. But what we're also doing in this church, we have been doing is that we are adapting our churches, which is the right thing to do, um, um, to try to reach our culture. And we are removing barriers that may have worked in one generation but may not be understood in this generation. And we are culturally changing the church to be relevant. And sometimes, and that's a little bit sore for us because sometimes we have to kill a few sacred cows. I'm okay with that. Because sometimes we have certain things that we're hanging on to that we are saying, well, I've always done it this way. And, and what that does, it just removes itself from having a unified culture of the house. And what I want, church, as your pastor, I want us to have a unified culture. So I'm happy for us all just to kill a few cows, that we can have one culture to reach people. 
That's all I want to do. I'm not interested in, 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 in private personal views. I'm interested in reaching people. I want to reach people with the love of God. I want you to know that Jesus loves you. And I don't want anything preventing the simplicity of people finding Jesus. That was free. That was free. So I'm okay if we kill cows so that we can reach people. You've all went very serious on me. But it's okay to do that because that's our mission is to reach people. And so I think it's right. I think it's wise. It is the right thing to do to win souls. It's the right thing. But I think in our understanding of the gospel of the kingdom, we have segregated a powerful aspect of the kingdom, which is the miraculous, which is the supernatural, where the Bible says that the word and the supernatural in the New Testament came as one together. It wasn't one and then another. It was an integral part of the kingdom of God that the word came with power. And where the presence of God in the miraculous, um, the kingdom of God is accompanied by an atmosphere of heaven that burst upon our communities and our churches and our daily lives that the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God that Jesus said was coming and then he said was going to be upon you and then he said would be in you and remember the kingdom of God is in the Holy Spirit, is going to be in you, has its fullness in the atmosphere of heaven, which is miraculous, it's powerful, it's supernatural, and it's awesome. That's the atmosphere of the kingdom of God. That is the atmosphere of heaven. And I have a conviction, and it's growing in me. And I have a conviction that the Holy Spirit wants to stir in us again. He's going to stir the church again um, to reach our hands out in expectation for the miraculous and for signs and for the supernatural. Can you say an amen in Jesus' name? And I want to stir your faith today uh, in the miraculous. Um, and I want to excite you and encourage you to expect the atmosphere of heaven. We should expect the atmosphere of heaven to fill and to overflow the atmosphere of this house and our lives in the supernatural as we stretch out spiritually our hands that the miraculous and the supernatural and the Holy Spirit atmosphere, this beautiful, free, is Holy Spirit atmosphere, the supernatural becomes tangible, uh, powerful, part of the experience of this church, a natural expression of our faith that when we speak of the gospel, when we say the gospel, the gospel, you, are you coming to the gospel service, brother? The gospel. What do we mean by the gospel? We're talking about a gospel that is full of power. It's the totality of the gospel message that Jesus and the disciples preached that impacts and touches and invades this generation with the miraculous and it becomes heaven on earth. That's what the gospel is. It's heaven on earth. So I want to look at this morning a God of miracles, uh, a kingdom filled atmosphere. And I want to talk through... Uh, I might teach, I might preach, I might just have a conversation. It's probably better having a conversation a lot of it this morning. We may have a conversation. Um, and hopefully at the end, we'll, you'll begin to say, I know my heart is stirred. I, I, I think there's more uh, to come. I think God has more for us. And my heart is stirred in miracles and a, and a God of miracles. Amen this morning. Um, Here's where I want to start this morning. I want to use, a, I want to make a statement and I want to use the statement to be really the foundation to allow me just to talk this morning. And it's this statement, um, um, and you have it there, Ben. My uh, belief in the miraculous has its basis in the God of miracles. Now, I know that sounds really simple, but that's where my belief in the miraculous comes from. It's because the God I serve is a God of miracles. Uh, he is a God of the impossible. Um, the Bible is not shy or hidden anywhere regarding God's greatness or His miraculous power. And so whether you look in the Old Testament, Old Covenant, or the New Covenant, it is full of the miraculous power of God. Um, the belief in the miraculous lies directly in our understanding of the awesomeness of God, what the Word says about Him, and His willingness to touch our world that heaven comes to earth. Our willingness, His willingness to touch uh, our, our earth, our this culture, this people. 
Um, when you lift your understanding to the powerfulness of God, um, and His willingness to visit, um, to abide with us, you will begin to see why the Bible says nothing is impossible with God. And we sing the song, nothing, absolutely nothing is impossible. We emphasize it, but, but, but I want you to believe it. Nothing is impossible with God. I have a quote here and it says, Impossibility only exists in the mind of a person who has not seen the greatness of God. That's where impossibility exists. It's only in a person who has not seen the greatness of God. God is greater than you think. God is more generous than you think. God is more powerful than than you think the bible says uh when you think whatever you think god's thoughts are higher um, whatever you imagine god has more imagination uh, whatever your vision is god has a better vision than you and um, so god's ways are always higher they're always better they're always greater and what we need to do in church and in our walk as believers we need to align our hearts and our speech with wh whom the bible declares god to be not who we think he is, but who the Bible says. And then you will begin to declare out of your mouth that God is not only able, but he's, he's willing to do something great because nothing is beyond the might and the power of a God who is miraculous. He's miraculous. The Bible says that God is a God of power. God is a God of power. He's a God of greatness. Um, we used to sing in primary school, our God is omnipotent. We sung that in P3. I had no idea what omnipotent meant, but I loved singing the word. And uh, I was trying to think where I, I first learned the song, and it was in the whole story of the nativity where I was, I was one of the kings. There was three kings. Uh, and the Bible story is one of the kings. Zella could even tell you my line, because uh, I've told her what the line was. I, was the king. I always wanted to be King Agrippa or Joseph. Joseph got the singing part. And, uh, but they never picked me for it. But we used to sing when we came. We talked from Jeremiah. It said Jeremiah came and he warned him. And then we would sing this. Our God is omnipotent. Shattered from the highest to the lowest in the land. And the word omnipotent means he is all powerful. Um, it means that he is almighty. I had the Jehovah's Witnesses call many years ago at my door and when they were trying to tell me how, and reduce Jesus to oh, only a lesser God, I, I said to them, well, uh, Jesus says in Revelation, I am the Almighty. How many Almighties can you have? And I, I, said, I said to him that God is Almighty, which means there is nobody greater than him. There is, there is no power beyond him. He is the Almighty Church. He is omnipotent. And there is no uh, weakness nor lack in his ability or his greatness. Nothing is too hard for God. Amen. Nothing. Jeremiah 32, 17 says, oh, by God, you have made the heavens. Now, you just need to stop because, uh, you know, if I just co cook this, you're going to go on to something else. But what does that mean? That means that there's a billion times a billion times a billion planets. In fact, the Bible says worlds without end. We cannot even fathom. We, we have only literally after 30 years left our solar system. And the Bible says there is billions upon billions of planets. And Jeremiah says, you have made the heavens. Let's get perspective this morning. He said, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power, omnipotent, and outstretched arm. Then he says, nothing is too difficult for you. Nothing. And then Hebrews, and one says, uh, he sustains the universe by the word of his power. Praise God this morning. He's an awesome God. He's omnipotent. He's great. He's powerful. Deuteronomy 10, 7 says, God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords. He is the great God and he is mighty and he is awesome. He is awesome. He's all powerful. He's omnipotent. No limitations to his strength. God is infinite. Uh, unlimited and unbounded. Psalmist David said, if I make my bed in hell, if I go to the lower parts of the sea, if I go into the heavens, even there God is, God's there. <laughs> God's there uh, because he's unlimited he's infinite God has no limitations no confinement he is the high and lofty one in Jeremiah 23 24 says he is high and he's lifted up church so when we're worshiping this morning we are worshiping a high and a lifted up God praise God nothing is beyond his power his presence and his might praise God, praise God. and I, I, I wrote uh, a, a, some 
thoughts and God, I just put them together in a, in a little quotation. And, and I wrote this here, Ben, you have it there. And it says, God is awesome and powerful. He is boundless, constant. He is glorious, super abundant. He is excellent, vast. He is full of goodness. And he is overflowing in the miraculous. That's the God who you serve this morning. That's the God when you say, I believe in Jesus. That's the God you serve this morning. And it's in this understanding of God, his greatness, that your heart can begin to believe for something extraordinary. Something that defies logic. It's remarkable to me that in all of our understanding of the Old and New Covenant, I think the Holy Spirit has been doing that with us for many years to bring a clarity. This is the, whole, this is the Holy Spirit doing this. But in all of our understanding of the Old and the New Covenant, that the flow of the miraculous is abundant in both. It's abundant in both. There isn't, there isn't less miracles in the Old Covenant. Um, they're nearly exactly the same. In fact, I'm sure if somebody was to look, you might find more miracles even in the Old Testament. I'm not sure. But there is an abundance of miracles and the supernatural activity of God in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. God doesn't really make a distinction in the Old and the New Testament because He's constant with His character. Um, it, and the only difference really that I see is in its geographical reach in that miracles were essentially confined to one nation in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, because the church is in all nations, then miracles are seen globally and geographically. And so I, I I see that miracles have an expanse in the, in the New Testament and every encounter with God in the Old and the New Testament was miraculous. It was miraculous. Um, the Bible gives extraordinary accounts of people who encountered the God of miracles. Extraordinary accounts. Um, in Genesis 12 and 21, God opens barrenness in the womb of Sarah so the promised seed could come. Now, I, I, I'm going to stop through these because I, I, I feel I want to impart some things to you. I, I cannot understand why God would have given uh, uh, a promise to Abraham as a young man and to Sarah and said, God's going to give you a son. And he, you, you, you know, I'm going to change your name, actually, Abraham, uh, from Abram to Abraham because it's going to mean father of plenty and father of many nations. And God speaks this prophetic word into Abraham. And now Abraham and Sarah are, are seven, Sarah is 75 years of age and her womb is now dead. And, and she's saying, where is the God of miracles? Where, where is the promise of the Lord? And what the Lord does, the Lord gives the dream and the promise and then he kills it. And then what he does, he comes in and he breaks barrenness. And I want to say that to you this morning. God breaks barrenness because he's a miracle working God. And when you think that God has given up on you in a situation or in a church or a ministry or in your own personal lives. And you think this is, this is the end of it. God says, no, I'm the God of Abraham. And I'm, I'm the one that's going to break the bar in this. And I am the one that's going to give you seed. And I'm going to one that's going to fulfill my promise in you, said the Lord. So he breaks bar in this and it becomes miraculous. And, and Isaac comes. God is in the business of breaking emptiness, church. Giving seed where there should be no seed. In Exodus 12 and 14, Israel walk on an ocean floor which is dry. Dry. I know you've all seen Cecil B. the Mills, but uh, you should see the cartoon, The Prince of Egypt. It does it much better. It does it really much better. And it stirs your heart when you look at it and you see them. Do you know that Israel walked five abreast? Five in the Bible is the number of grace, and they're walking through but it's just opened this door. And, and I just want to say to you this morning, in possible situations, God just opens. And then when you're walking through them, he's going to give you the grace right in the situation. And you're going to look at your enemies to the left and right behind you, and you're going to see the favor of the Lord. In 1 Kings, we're told that a cruise of oil would not fail until the famine passes. And this is a word, actually, when I was out walking uh, a couple of weeks ago, the Holy Spirit spoke really into my heart about the situation, the cruise of oil. But I was thinking about it this morning. I'm, we, I'm looking at the cruise of oil. I'm looking at the cruise of oil. I'm looking at the jar that's not going to fail. But actually, really, you know, it's God actually saying, I'm not going to fail. 
I'm not going to run out. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be your fulfillment in this. In Joshua 10 and 12, the sun stands still beyond the normal 24 hours. Do you believe that this morning? Do you, do you believe that, that when you have a door or a season when you need to walk through something but you don't even have the strength, you know what God says? I'm going to extend the door until you have the strength to walk through it. I'm going to extend the door. In Daniel 3, God preserves the life of three Hebrew boys, even though they stand in the midst of a fire. He, the Bible actually says there wasn't even a whiff of smoke on them. He, he preserves. He preserves when the enemy comes against. He just preserves your life. And so the Old Testament is full of miracles. I, I could just go on this morning, give you miracles. In the Gospels, in the book of Acts, we have an overflow of continual miracles. Jesus uh, raises the dead. He actually stops a funeral procession to raise the dead. The blind continually see. The lame and the infirm are made whole. Multitudes are miraculously fed on multiple occasions by the hand of the Lord. Storms are rebuked. Uh, the demonic are freed. Um, a man is healed at the door of the church. Hallelujah. In Acts chapter 3, and he gets up his bed and he walks. Wouldn't you like church to be like that? Angels visit Paul and Silas in the prison while they're having a praise service. Peter's shadow heals the sick. In Acts 19 and 11, the Bible says that God did extraordinary miracles through Paul. Or by the hands of Paul And Job 5 and 9 says, God performs wonders that cannot be fathomed. Miracles that cannot be counted. God is miraculous. Why am I saying this this morning? I'm saying it because I want to stir us. I want to lift our expectation that a normal experience of Christianity and a normal encounter with God should be infused with the miraculous. That's normal. That's normal. Can I make a statement to you which I think is going to challenge you? Um, but it's going to challenge you in the right way. Um, and it's, it's really this here. You're going to have it on the screen there for me. Um, our church culture, because every church has a culture. Our church culture and experience needs to go beyond a gospel of words. Of words. Uh, we're living in a generation that so much needs an impact of the Holy Spirit. Most impossible situations. Um, of the mind, of bodies, of, oh, we just need an impact of the Holy Spirit. And so our cult church culture needs to go beyond the gospel of words. We have settled for less when we close off miracles and the supernatural. How could you ever read the Bible with not embracing a God of miracles? I don't understand it. When Jesus said the kingdom is coming or the kingdom of God is among you, in fact, he used that term when, when they were being, people were being healed. He said, the kingdom of God is among you. When the kingdom of God is among you, here's, I want you to get this, because this is the last five, ten minutes what I'm going to say, but this is the most important bit. He was opening to us heaven's atmosphere. In the natural world that surrounds us. When Jesus said, how should you pray? When Jesus said, I want you to pray, let your kingdom come. It was an invitation for heaven's atmosphere, a heaven's culture to permeate and invade our natural surroundings. You see, the kingdom, got this, Ben, this is really important. The kingdom among us has to look like the kingdom above us. Let your kingdom come. It's, it's not our church culture or our church traditional culture that needs, that we need to maintain it's, it's heaven's culture we need to maintain. It's kingdom culture. Uh, Jesus was so clear in inviting the kingdom of heaven into every situation. Our church culture has to be a re representation of heaven's culture. It has to be as in heaven, so let it be on earth. Not on earth as in heaven. You know, we, sometimes we're protecting the wrong thing. We should be protecting heaven's culture. Heaven's culture. I'm praying heaven's culture into this situation. 
Um, church culture needs to reflect heaven's culture here on earth as it is in heaven. The manifestation of the kingdom of God among us pushes us into the natural atmosphere of heaven which becomes for us the miraculous, the impossible. Normal for heaven but extraordinary to us. Normal for heaven. Um, what is the culture of heaven? Have you ever asked yourself that question? Because it's really important you need to know if Jesus is saying, as it is in heaven, so let it be in earth. So you should know what the culture is. What is the culture of heaven? Well, it is a culture that is saturated and infused with the presence of God. The greatest value in heaven is the presence of God. Heaven only knows light, uh, revelation, glory, dominion. It permeates everywhere in the presence of God. Presence travels in light. Bible says you alone are the fountain of life and in your life, your presence, we see light. That's why Jesus said, I am the light of the world. I am the light. It's, it's me. It's, I'm, the, I'm the presence. When the Holy Spirit was given to the church, it lifted us into the culture of heaven, which, a cult, which is the culture of the impossible, which is the culture of the presence of God. The presence of God. The Bible says the kingdom of God is in the Holy Spirit. It's righteousness, peace, and joy where? It's in the Holy Ghost. Um, the kingdom of God is in the Spirit of God. God lifts our culture into kingdom culture, into spirit, in the spirit, into the spirit. Why is there an overflow of the miraculous in the first church? Because they realized that they carried the kingdom of God. Because the Bible says the kingdom of God is within you. Everywhere they want, they carried the, the spirit, the personality, the culture of heaven, the presence of heaven. And it permeated then the culture around them. They were carriers of the presence of the kingdom. Praise God, church. The surprises of a healing moment or a miracle moment or an impossible encounter are only glimpses of heaven bursting onto our natural understanding of God. The flow of miraculous comes out of intimacy and presence. The flow of the miraculous comes out of intimacy and presence. That's why you see Jesus healing multitudes and then going along with his father. Presence. Because virtue has left him, now he goes to presence to fill him. The flow of the miraculous is out of presence. In Mark chapter 16, which is a really famous verse and phrase, it, it says, and we quote it, I hear people quoting it, it says, the Lord working with them, confirming the word through accompanying signs. There, there's, your, there's one of your verses to let you know that signs were part, an integral part of the gospel being preached. But it has its root meaning, the Lord working with them in a term partnership, but a partnership that is intimate, uh, that unites to achieve something great. It's an intimacy. The miraculous flows out of intimacy and presence in the Holy Spirit. Awareness of His presence, His intimacy. It is the reason why the miraculous flows. It flows from intimacy, kingdom, presence. Presence. I heard a preacher uh, say something this week which uh, was a little bit controversial but really began to struck a chord. In fact, the more I the more I read it, the more I said, this man is absolutely spot on. This is a great teacher in the body of Christ. Man is full of the Word of God. Man has written many books. Um, and uh, I, don't think we've, I don't think we're familiar with him here. Um, we certainly don't have any of his books in the bookstore at this point. Um, but he said a statement this week. And I think this is worthy for you to, to hear today and to allow it to challenge your heart. He said, we have as a church culture... Um, Encamped around a sermon. The sermon, the sermon, the sermon. Many, many, many sermons have you heard? How many sermons have you heard? I was speaking to a preacher recently and he said to me, I'm about to preach with 1,251st message to the church. How's your church going? Awful. He said to me, awful. 
And we, we have as a church culture encamped around the sermon, but he said, but Israel encamped around the presence. It's a pretty profound statement. And it wasn't a neg uh, negation to be a strong teaching church or a strong word church. That's not what he was saying. That is not the point. The point is the word is to bring us to him. It's to bring us to presence. We're not to love the word more than him. Or more than the presence. Jesus once talked to your people that he said, you know the scriptures. He said, you're searching in the scriptures, but you won't come to me. They knew the scriptures. But he said, you won't come to me to have life. And I think that principles or knowledge, that's God speaking to you. He said, awake from the dead, church. <laughs> I think principles, I wonder is it heaven getting ready to come to earth? I think that principles, knowledge, Help us stay in good paths. But they are not a substitute for presence. We shout about principles when we have lost intimacy. We shout about doctrine when we have lost presence. Knowing God is not knowledge, it's intimacy. It's not more scriptures, it's not more sermons, it's intimacy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Intimacy is God's presence in feeding our world and our culture. Virtue flows out of intimacy. That's why we call you to intimacy, not, not so much church, not ministry. We call you to intimacy with Jesus, with the Father. Jesus doesn't put a, a limit on the amount of heaven's influence on earth, but he does continually invite us into a relationship of intimacy and presence because he knows that miracles, kingdom, presence flows from intimacy. What would our lives, our services, what would church on a Sunday morning look like if we lingered a little bit more in presence, intimacy, where we valued presence above ministry? Moses, and even in the old covenant, he said, God, if your presence doesn't go with me, I don't even want to, I don't want to leave this place. And he was old covenant. Because God said to him, the distinctiveness of, of the church in the Old Testament was going to be me. My presence. Valued presence above ministry. To walk in intimacy during the week. Do you walk in intimacy with the Lord? Do you have cool of the day times? Where the Holy Spirit's gone. I, I wish they would just come. I, I, I just wish they would. I'm so desperate to spend time with you. I, I, I'll make time. In the busyness of the universe, for to be at the with you. To walk in industry, to spend time not doing, but being. I, I, I think for every new convert that's going to come into this church, I'm not going to teach them, first of all, about serving. I'm going to teach them about knowing. I think serving comes out of knowing. I think the church is taught serving, but I think we should teach knowing. And you have the best servers. I think God wants the full expression of his presence to break and touch our church culture. Because I tell you what, there's people that are sick. There's people that have impossible situations. There are people that are under demonic influence. There are societies that are going to hell in a handcart. And we need the presence of God. We don't need more intellectual apologists to come to the church. We need somebody that can stretch their hand in Jesus' name and say, Behold, in the name of Jesus. In an enlightened, knowledge-filled, advanced, technological society where within a few years we're going to have men sitting on Mars and sending signals back and we're having satellites going beyond the reaches of our solar system. I think that God of the universe wants to break through this culture with His power, which is going to confine all of our reasoning. That people will say, why are they like that? And they'll say, they took note that they've been with Jesus. You remember the phrase in the New Testament? They took note that they'd been with Jesus because extraordinary things were done by the church. And ordinary days become amazing as we penetrate our society with the miraculous presence of God, kingdom of God. The river heals everything it touches, but it flows from presence. 
Where does the river flow from in Ezekiel? It flows from the altar. It flows from an intimate people, and then the river touches everything. Intimacy is the reason why the miraculous flows, the reason why Jesus said, I, I go and spend time with my Father, and then I come back and I pray more for the sick. You say amen. Um, I think, I think that God has opened to us grace. Or our understanding of grace, boy, whatever degree, I think you know that God is good. I think you know God is for you. And you're, you're hearing these terms and you, you're embracing it and you're saying, thank God for that. But I think God has opened that revelation of him to us because he wants to further bring us into a flow of the miraculous. I, I, I think miracles flow from grace. I think that the miraculous is a gateway to a harvest. An ordinary part of God's kingdom upon our daily lives and culture, God trusts the miraculous to those who know grace. Reflect his heart and his character. I don't think God wants to bring a harvest to a place where they, they don't reflect God, where they, they tell you God's angry with you and, and you've got to do 27 things and you bypass the cross. I think God wants to bring a harvest to churches that, that know that the cross is enough. Jesus is enough. Grace is enough. So here's what I want to say to you this morning. Um, can I encourage everybody that sits here to expect more? Is it, is it just possible in, in everything that I've said that you will say, do you know what, I, I'm going to linger a little bit more. I, uh, I want a little bit more uh, of the presence and the power of the Lord in my life. I want you to open your spirit to the atmosphere of intimacy where you say, you know what, I value, I value the presence of God. Where I expect the kingdom among us to, and the kingdom that is in us, to be like the kingdom above us. And then it would flow to every situation. Church is a great place for an atmosphere of the Holy Spirit to break loose. And it will. But you carry the kingdom within you during the week at bus stops, and university areas, in, in your own home with your children, your grandchildren, with the neighbor beside you. And when the church just does that with its hand, you begin to see miracles. You begin to see supernatural things. You begin to see turnarounds that you would never believe. You should expect miracles because the miracle of God is not only in the house, he's in the heart. And I want to encourage you and I, I, I want you to know that God is visiting us and be part of the season of visitation. Be part of the season that you've long waited for and allow God to break loose. Let surplus anointing just break loose in the house. Just expect God. Don't, don't say there's three days until the harvest. Jesus says, no, it's, it's here. Just lift up your eyes and begin to hold an intimacy with heaven. Can you just say amen? amen. To that this morning would you just would you stand just for a moment and then after this we're gonna uh, dismiss you this morning um, principles are great but Jesus is better Jesus is much better and uh, God just wants you to an intimacy with him um, the key of life is intimacy um, it's routine with the Lord it's intimacy um, the key to an overflowing church of miraculous is that we, that we expect more because we have a great God. We don't, we don't limit God. We don't send our hearts saying, I don't think God could do that. God doesn't respond to a heart like that. He responds to a heart and says, God, I think you can. I have very little faith to believe this. But God said, you have little faith? Okay. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move in that little faith. That's enough for me. Um, so I, I want to just pray. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to close your eyes. Uh, I want us as a church, the whole church, every part of the church, right in the, right the very back, the media team, those in the camera, um, those that are maybe just watching here. Uh, I want every, everybody just to lift your hands for a moment to the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, we, we thank you for that you did not leave us comfortless, but you have, you have imparted us and quickened us with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit knows how to speak right into the 
uh, places of uh, our hearts and of our thinking. And I, I pray, Father, today for um, there would be a, a renewed faith and a renewed expectation. Um, there would be a, a stretching forth at the hand of the church, Lord. There would be a stretching forth in our individual lives over impossible situations, over places that only a miracle can work, Lord, of places that we know we need a supernatural turnaround, a supernatural healing, Lord, a supernatural faith, even for faith to increase for a situation. Lord, you are able to do it because you are the great and awesome one. You are omnipotent and you are all-powerful, O Lord, and you partner with us for your kingdom. My prayer today is that you would open that to us, Lord. And that you would open heaven upon earth, Lord. That we would welcome your kingdom. We would embrace your kingdom. Lord, like a childlike faith. When you said, except you embrace us, you cannot enter the kingdom except you come as a child. That, Lord, there would be a childlikeness in our spirits to say, Lord, we welcome your kingdom here. We welcome your presence, Lord. We welcome your flow of heaven upon earth. Heaven upon our church culture. So, Father, I, I just ask the Holy Spirit that you would renew in us. A revived expectation um, that you among us is miraculous. And that you're able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we can ask or think, that our words would be integrated with power of the Holy Spirit. The Lord intimately working with us, confirming with sign and wonders. I release it upon the house today. I release it upon this year. I release it upon our homes today that we carry the kingdom. And we carry heaven's presence in Jesus' name. We just say a big amen this morning. God bless you. Give the Lord a hand.